Members of the jury, as you may recall from Saturday, the next phase of this trial will be closing statements by counsel. Please remember that uh, statements made by counsel aren't evidence. We've completed the evidence so far. So with that being said, the state uh, proceeds first. Mr. Burling. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The defendant, Gail Ritchie, is charged with two counts, aggravated murder and murder. Before you can return a verdict of guilty on either or both counts, you have to find that first, the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt each and every element of both or, or either of those offenses. And as the judge just mentioned, and as he instructed you before we got started, statements by counsel are not evidence. So the opening statements that I made and the defense made, not to be considered by you in determining whether or not these elements have been proven. Instead, it's the evidence that you heard during the trial, the testimony and the exhibits that have been admitted into evidence that you'll get to see when you deliberate. So let's look at the elements of both counts. And both counts cover the same act, uh, action here, the death, the killing of, by the defendant of her child. So aggravated murder, the elements of which in this case would be in March of 1993 in Geauga County, Ohio, the defendant purposely and with prior calculation and design caused the death of another. And again, judge is going to be instructing you on the, the law. He's going to be giving you written instructions. Again, if there's any uh, difference between what I say and what he says, you always go with what the judge says or the instructions. Murder is almost identical, except it removes the element of prior calculation and design. It's just the purposeful killing of another. So there are some initial findings you have to, to make. First of all, the timing. So we have here March of 1993. Now, the judge is going to instruct you that it's not necessary that we prove that the offense was committed on the exact day as charged in the indictment, just that it's a, a date reasonably near the date that the offense occurred. So how do we get to March 1993? Well, the body is found in Geauga County on March 25th of 1993. And in the defendant's interview, she indicates she's not exactly sure when the birth happened, but she thinks that she dumped the child a couple days or a couple weeks after giving birth. That put us, what, earlier March? Now, defense has admitted into evidence some um, documents from the camp that the defendant and, uh, would go to that indicates that she went to a retreat at the end of February. 1993. And she does say that maybe she dumped the body when she went to that retreat. Again, we just need a date that's reasonably near the date that this happened. So even if you determine that the, the birth and the killing of the child happened near the end of February, March of 1993 is pretty close to <coughs> when this, this incident happened. So the state has proven the time element. Venue. Now, you heard in the defendant's interview, she says that she gave birth in Shaker Heights in Cuyahoga County, put the child in the garbage bag where he presumably died, put him in her trunk, and then dumped him. It's appropriate to charge the case in the county in which the body or a part of the body is found. So here, I don't think there's any dispute that the child was found here in Geauga County on Sydney Road in Thompson Township. The garbage bag that he was put in was found about eight-tenths of a mile from that body, also in Geauga County. So that's where the body was found. Geauga County is the appropriate venue to bring this case. So that covers the second The defendant Detective Seaman has identified the defendant, Gail Ritchie, here in the courtroom as, in fact, the person that he interviewed about this case who did admit to being the person who gave birth and put the child in the garbage bag, ultimately killing the child. So identity has been established. So that takes us to 
the, the real heart of both of these charges. Did, does the evidence show that the defendant either purposely killed another, caused the death of another, or purposely and with prior calculation and design caused the death of another? Let's talk about causation. So causation is an act that directly produces the result, in this case the death of another, without which that death would not have occurred. So, before we even get to the act that the defendant took, the placing of this child in that garbage bag, we have to show that, in fact, the child was born alive. Obviously, if he was still born, no matter what action the defendant took, she wouldn't have caused his death. So, did the state present enough, sufficient evidence for you to find beyond a reasonable doubt that the child was born alive? Yes. You'll have the autopsy report that was prepared by Dr. Chaloner back in 1993. And based on his findings in that case, he determined that the child at issue was a full-term live born and was about But in addition to that, there was no finding of infection or birth defects in any of the remaining organs that would have rendered this child stillborn or caused him to die soon after birth. Now it's true, you saw those pictures, this child was badly mutilated, missing limbs, missing multiple organs. But Dr. Filo testified that in order for a live birth to occur, you only need three organs the brain, the heart, and the lungs. All three still were in the, the child's body when he was recovered. Now the brain had been reduced to basically a, a, a liquid mass at this point because of bacteria. But Dr. Filo testified he could still be certain that the brain was, would have um, supported life because there was no other findings about the skull and, and the, the brain area that would have shown that this brain was, was, would have been malformed or uh, developed in a way as not to support life. And then we have the heart. No findings of abnorma abnormalities in the heart. It appeared to be healthy. And then the one remaining lung, same thing. No findings of abnorm abnormalities. It appeared to be a perfectly functioning lung. And based on the size of the infant, he appears to be a full term, and so he would have been able to survive on his own outside the womb. So taking that findings of breathing into the child. It wasn't from bacteria because he testified, and, and the defense expert agreed, this lung was very well preserved. No evidence of bacteria. That bacteria is along with the, uh, well, let me step back, the bacteria, if bacteria existed, that certainly could produce gases that would have caused the lung tissues to expand. Bacteria in the The only conclusion is that this is air that was breathed in by the infant because they were non distended, those spaces, indicating the child had breathed on his own. The distended part portion, again, Dr. Field testified that could happen either by bacteria, but again, we have no bacteria present, or someone performing CPR and forcing air into the lungs. Because we have no evidence of bacteria, that's got to be the only explanation here. But even absent that, we have, again, that 55, 60% of the lung tissue that shows that the child breathed on his own. So the breathing on his own, 
combined with the fact that the child was otherwise a healthy baby boy, indicates this was a live birth. So then, did the defendant's actions cause his death? Well, Dr. Filo, well, I guess first of all, Dr. Challoner made the finding that the cause of death here was undetermined violent cause. And Dr. Filo's explanation of what that means is that they couldn't come up with an exact cause of death, but because this was a live child who was otherwise <coughs> healthy, the only conclusion they could make is that some action caused an unnatural death. This child otherwise would have lived had someone not done something. And when pro posed with a hypothetical, if the child had been placed in a garbage bag and the garbage bag tied up, you know, what, what, that, what would that have done to the child? Well, he would have suffocated. That's an act by someone else that unnaturally caused this child's death. Here, we have evidence that was found nearby the child's body of a garbage bag that was torn open, that had blood in it, that later tested positive, or that tested, that matched the DNA of the child and the DNA of the defendant, Gail Rich. And we have her own statement to the police where she admitted that after giving birth, she took this child, placed him in a garbage bag, tied him up, which would have cut off his oxygen, and placed him in her trunk. Her actions caused the death of this child. So causation has been established. Now let's talk about purposely. Did she purposely cause the death of this child? Now purpose, to act purposely is to act with the specific intent to cause a result. And it's a decision of the mind that in order to prove it, you have to look at the acts that someone takes when they're acting under this uh, mental state. You can also look at the statements that they make when they're interviewed. So, does the evidence establish that she purposely caused the death of the child? Well, taking an otherwise healthy baby boy and putting him in a garbage bag and tying the, the top closed, I mean, there's really no other conclusion you can come to than she intended to end his life. That is what's going to happen when you put not just a, a baby in a garbage bag, but any person you cut off oxygen. The only possible end here was that child was going to die. And so she did act purposely in doing so. Now we also have her, um, her statement to the officers to, to take a look at. And there are some inconsistencies here. Um, <coughs> mainly that she is brought in about two weeks after the officers first approach her parents. So she's aware that this is being looked into. She's aware that uh, officers are tracking down, took the, the parents' DNA, they're probably trying to identify who the the mother of this child is. So she's got some time to put together an explanation of what happened. And when she's asked about what happened, she says she's in Shaker Heights as a nanny for this family. And while everyone's gone, the kids are at school, parents are at work, she gives birth in the bathroom, births the child into the toilet. No one else is aware. No one else is around. Takes the child, puts him in a garbage bag, puts him in her trunk. And when she's asked why, why did she do this? Why was she in this position where she didn't tell anyone? She didn't go and get any help. She discusses that you know she was afraid that she would lose her her boy, then boyfriend at the time, now husband, the father of the child. She was concerned because. Her father had told her and her sister, you know, don't ever have kids out of wedlock. So here she is, a pregnant woman, she's single, just afraid about the consequences of what was going to happen. Now, in jury selection, I, I asked all of you, and you all agreed that it would be wrong to make your decision in this case 
based upon sympathy. Either sympathy for the child because he saw those pictures and felt bad for what happened to the child and decided to vote guilty just because of the pictures, that would be wrong. But it would also be wrong to vote not guilty simply because he felt bad for the situation that the defendant was in. It would be understandable to have sympathy for her. <coughs> She's, again, young, unmarried, doesn't know what to do. She acted out of fear, presumably. But that doesn't, <coughs> acting out of fear doesn't negate the purpose element. You know, I think a lot of times you hear someone is charged with murder and you think, you know, that the defendant is, was angry at someone and just wanted to hurt that other person and end their life. And certainly that is a, a, a way to act purposely, with malice. But you can also act purposely out of fear. And again, if you believe the defendant's explanation of why she did this, that's why she was acting uh, purposely. She was acting out of fear. She didn't know what to do. But again, she made the decision <coughs> to put her child in a garbage bag, again, out of fear, but knowing that this was going to kill him. This was a purposeful act. Even if you feel sympathy for the reasons behind it, she acted purposely. Now, the other part about purposely is that she would actually have to be aware that the child was born alive. And when she's asked about that in her interview, her response is, I don't know, I'm not sure. I don't remember whether or not the child was moving, if he was making noise or not. But you have to ask yourself, is that reasonable? She says in her interview that for a while she didn't know she was pregnant, but then for about three months she was aware. She didn't get any help from doctors. According to her, she didn't seek out any help from others to help her work through this. But she knew that at some point she was going to give birth. I mean, that's a, that's a deadline that's going to be coming up. And she's done taken no steps to address what she's going to do when she gives birth. And so is it, is it reasonable that she's not really going to pay that much attention to the status of the child once he when she births him. I will remind you that when she's asked about that retreat, she rattles off the names of the girls that she took to that retreat 26 years prior for a weekend retreat. That one she remembers, but was the child moving? Was he making noise? Well, I, I don't know. Why doesn't she remember? Because she doesn't want to say. She doesn't want to admit. Now, Detective Seaman testified that you know he could only verify very basic things about her story. Obviously, she's the mother. We can show that from the DNA test. <coughs> she stuck the baby in a garbage bag because we found the garbage bag. And the baby was dumped in the woods because that's where we found the, the garbage bag. As far as the actual circumstances of what went down, whether it actually happened in uh, Shaker Heights or if it happened somewhere else, we don't know. It's too late. It's 26 years later. We can't get. We can't go back to the scene and get forensic evidence that you know her body fluids or the child's body fluids were in the that bathroom, or that in the trunk of the car she had back then we would have found body fluids. We, it's, it's just way too late. So going into this interview, she she's got to be aware that we're going to know if she's the mother, and because we've recovered the body, she's going to know that we have the garbage bag. So she's got to admit to that stuff. Maybe it was her intent to say the child was stillborn, but up front, Detective Seaman indicates to her this autopsy shows the child was born alive and was breathing. So that's out. So what can she do now? Well, the only thing she can do now is, because she's confronted with a statement from the detective that the child was born alive, she can't just straight out and say the child was stillborn. She's got to equivocate. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't really remember. But again, it's up to you to determine, is that reasonable? And we submit to you, it is not. She remembers those other facts, the, the kids that she took to the retreat, but she doesn't remember this extremely important incident, giving birth to a child, and she doesn't remember, was he moving, was he breathing? That's because she does remember. The child was born alive, and she knows because she's being interrogated about his death. She's trying to stay 
she's trying to give forward, forth an explanation that will keep her out of as much trouble as possible. Now you might ask yourself, why didn't she tell the officers that she gave CPR to the child? Because Dr. Filo indicates that someone gave CPR to the child. Well, that's further evidence that the story that she's telling you is not true. Again, she's being questioned about this child, about his death. She knows that they're looking for who killed this child. If she had actually performed CPR on the child, you put that out there right away. This was a stillborn born child. I tried to revive him. He wasn't moving. I breathed into his lungs. He didn't survive. She doesn't say that because she didn't do it. She's probably not even aware that someone else did. And again, this undercuts her story because someone else did perform CPR, but she says no one else was present. So basically, her whole story about the circumstances of this child, of the birth and the child's death, there's no, we, we can't take that for certain. The, the fact that someone breathed in this child's lungs and she never brings it up says it did not happen the way she says it happened. So we don't even know if it happened at in uh, Shaker Heights or did it happen at the camp? Did it happen somewhere else? We don't know, but we do know someone else had to be present because otherwise she would have claimed that she had tried to revive this boy. And again, if the child was actually stillborn and she had tried to revive him, up front, when the officers said, we know the child was born alive, you'd think she'd say, no, he wasn't. I tried to revive him. He was stillborn. But she doesn't say that. Instead, it's, I don't know. I don't remember. Why? Because the child was born alive, and she killed him. And she knows that. And now she knows she's caught. So the evidence does prove that she purposely caused the death of this child. So the elements of murder have been met. But then finally, you have to uh, look at, for aggravated murder, did the state prove prior calculation and design? And that's a, another term for basically premeditation. And that's the, basically the planning in advance of what you're going to do. And now this, the judge is going to instruct you that you know, this is not just a spur of the moment to snap decision. There's got to be some thinking that's gone into the defendant's actions. It doesn't have to be a long time, but it has to sh the evidence has to show that she thought this through and had this plan in place. So what is the evidence that she had the plan in place? Well, first of all, again, she's it, taking her at her word, she's aware that she's pregnant for about three months. Again, because there's inconsistencies, is that true or not? We don't know. But again, what does she do to prepare for the birth? Nothing. Doesn't go to the doctor, doesn't tell anyone, doesn't have anything in place for when she gives birth to this child. Again, leading up to this deadline, basically it appears her plan is to not do anything with the child, give birth to him, and we'll see what happens. And what do we see what happens? is that she kills the child. She puts him in the garbage bag, which is further evidence of prior calculation and design. Because once she gives birth, it's not like she's sitting right there and immediately has a garbage bag next to her. She either had to go get that garbage bag before she gave birth, or after giving birth, she gets up and walks somewhere and grabs a garbage bag. Either one of those shows that this was planned out. She didn't just have one in her pocket because she carries one around with her. This was a plan that she put in place. And there's your prior calculation and design. So the evidence does show that all the elements of aggravated murder have been proven. This is a situation where a newborn baby boy was born <coughs> to this woman and she literally treated him like a piece of garbage. She birthed him, threw him in a garbage bag, tied him up, suffocating him, and tossed him in the woods. Didn't even bury him. And again, listening to her, her interview, barely gave it a thought. 
for 26 years. This is the time for you to give this case your full attention and your full thought. The state has proven all the elements of both charges beyond a reasonable doubt, and we ask that you return verdicts of guilty to both charges. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. <coughs> Stand up and strike. Mr. Bradley, you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, everybody. The evidence and testimony that was presented during the course of this trial is obviously centered around this issue of live birth versus stillbirth. And to be clear, we as the defense maintain that the greater weight of the evidence here points to the fact that this was a stillbirth, not a live birth. And I think that's particularly true here because there really is no evidence, no reliable evidence, that this was in fact a live birth. The only evidence that the state has presented to you is in the form of those three microscopic tissue slides. And so that that, through the testimony of two medical experts, Dr. Filo and Dr. Harshbarger, that that's not reliable evidence in this case because of this whole issue of decomposition. So, while it is true and important to understand that we maintain the greater weight of the evidence points to a stillbirth, it is important when you deliberate this case to understand that we as the defense bear no burden of proof. It is not incumbent upon we as the defense to prove, to affirmatively prove that this was a stillbirth. In fact, just the opposite is true. The burden is entirely on the state of Ohio to affirmatively prove beyond a reasonable doubt <coughs> that this was a live birth. And, and this continuum kind of illustrates that point. 
So as I said, we've heard over the last several days all this testimony and, and evidence directed to the issue of stillbirth. And you may agree with me that the greater weight of the evidence in fact establishes that this is a stillbirth. But ultimately, even though, though you are to <coughs> deliberate as a group with the objective of reaching a unanimous verdict, ultimately, each one of you have to decide this case individually for yourselves. And some of you might disagree, then say, I don't think the greater weight of the evidence establishes this as a stillbirth. I don't think so. And you might instead think, it's, I, I can't say one way or the other. That falls short, well short, of their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You might say, well, frankly, I, I think it's more likely than not that this was a live birth. I disagree with the defense that the greater weight shows this is a stillbirth. In fact, I think it's more likely than that that this was, in fact, a live birth that still falls short of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That's not enough. And I start here because that is that these concepts of burden of proof and proof beyond a reasonable doubt are, are just fundamental to your deliberations. They have to serve as the backdrop, the basis for everything you do in that jury deliberation. When we're done, meaning the lawyers, when we're done arguing this case to you, the, the judge will read you a series of jury instructions, the law applicable in this case. And included in those jury instructions will be the, the instruction regarding the burden of proof. Every person accused of an offense is presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and the burden of proof rests entirely upon the prosecution. And proof beyond a reasonable doubt also, like so many things in the law, has a legal definition. And there is more to the definition of reasonable doubt than we have shown up here. And I will certainly uh, encourage <coughs> urge you to listen to the judge's instructions, because that's what controls But, but suffice it to say, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, proof of such character that an ordinary person would be willing to rely and act upon it in the most important of your own affairs. And certainly we will ask you, when you retire to that delivery, to consider what would be the most important of your own affairs. Invest in your life savings. Making a critical decision whether to have some surgery performed on one of your children. The most important of your own affairs. And think about quality of information and evidence that you would want, require, and expect when you're making a decision regarding the most important of your own affairs. So, as I said, even though we as the defense bear no burden of proof here, We've certainly presented evidence that indicates this was, in fact, a stillbirth. And that the greater weight of the evidence 
shows this is a still birth. I disagree with the prosecutor's characterization of some of the things that Gail said in her interview to law enforcement, and specifically regarding, I didn't see the baby move, I didn't hear the baby make a sound. But ultimately, that's in evidence. That interview is in evidence. You will have the opportunity to review it in its entirety. We've already seen it in open court, I'm sure have your independent recollections of what she said in that interview, but at the end of the day, you can look at it again and you can see for yourself that she never indicates that she saw the baby move or heard the baby make a sound. In fact, just the opposite. That she didn't see the baby move. That she didn't hear the baby make and all of that would be evidence consistent with the fact that this was not a live birth. This is, in fact, a still birth. And continue on, just the other things that you heard. The no umbilical cord inflammation. You heard, uh, well, both experts, but I'm primarily thinking of Dr. Harshbarger, that talks about there, if there was evidence of inflammation at the tip or end of the umbilical cord, that would be evidence that the body was wounded, healing itself, and thus evidence of a live birth. But in fact, there was none of that present, which is just more information, data points, as Dr. Harshbarger used the term, that points to the direction of a stillbirth. <clears throat> also in her interview, she talks about how the birth was happened very quickly, how the placenta all just followed out with the body, that she had no contractions, very little pain. That's all evidence that points to this was a stillbirth. But again, before I go on, to be crystal clear, that's important evidence for you to consider, particularly when you're considering whether the state has met its burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt that this was a live birth. But we don't bear that burden. And it's important that, well, I'm, I don't know one way or the other, or if, if you had to make me pick, I'd pick that it was a live birth. That's not enough. Not even close. So again, these concepts of burden and proof, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, proof of such character that an ordinary person such as yourself would be willing to rely and act upon it in the most important of your own affairs. And if you work through it, there really is no reliable evidence whatsoever that this was a live birth. So, let me move on. You, you heard the prosecutor touch on some of the elements of the crimes charged that they're required to prove. The court in, their, in his instructions of law that he'll read to you when we're done arguing up here will detail those elements of the crimes charged. But certainly one of those elements that the state has to prove and prove beyond a reasonable doubt Assuming that you get over the threshold of a live birth, that still does not decide this case. It is not as simple of, if the state proved this beyond a reasonable doubt to be a live birth, therefore she is guilty. No, that is not correct. Because 
again, assuming that they've crossed that threshold, they have to prove that Gail intended to cause death, that it was her purpose. She had a criminal intent to kill her child. And then, again, one of the instructions that the court will read to you will address this issue of intent. Before you can find the defendant guilty of murder, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant purposely caused the death of baby boy death. And purpose, the judge will explain to you in these instructions, is the same as intent. They are synonymous. So it must be established in this case that at the time in question, it was present in Gail's mind that she had a specific intention, criminal intent, to cause her child's death. And think about this, and we're back to the tape again. <laughs> Gail tells the detective that she did not hear the baby make a sound. That she did not see the baby move. So, regardless of ultimately, if theoretically, the baby was born alive and survived a matter of seconds, for whatever reason, that we don't know. But Gail didn't perceive that, that she perfect perceived, right, rightly or wrongly, but reasonably perceived that it was a stillborn baby. And she then put the baby's body in a garbage bag. Then she is not acting with a specific purpose or intent to cause that baby's death. So again, just like this question of live birth versus stillbirth <coughs> must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, same thing with this question of intent, criminal intent to cause death. And I will encourage and urge you to pay close attention to those definitions that we've walked through in light of what Gail said to the detective. I didn't see the baby move. I didn't hear the baby make a sound. So again, it's not as simple as live birth proven beyond a reasonable doubt equals guilty. No, that is not correct. So, as I said early on, we believe that the greater weight of the evidence, in fact, shows this is a still birth. And while we don't have that burden of proof, so to speak, we do not have that burden. It is still important information, obviously, <coughs> for you to consider as to the question of, have they, hey, they, they, the state of Ohio, proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that this, in fact, was a live birth. And, and really, this is, important stuff I'm about to go over here, because I think this is, can conclude definitively your deliberations. So, I ask you to pay close attention here. Um, we've heard all of this testimony from Dr. Filo and Dr. Harshbarker about the avilii, the expanded, the collapsed air spaces that some of which are expanded. And you'll recall that Dr. Philo testified that normal breathing 
cannot cause these distended alveoli. Normal breathing won't do that. And, and the alveoli, I think it, one of the two doctors uh, agreed with the analogy of a balloon. You know, the breathing, the, when the baby is born, the, the balloon is collapsed and deflated. And then when we are born, we breathe and, and effectively expand the balloon. The alveoli. And, and that's what normal breathing will do. Expand the balloon. <clears throat> but both doctors agreed that at least in the tiny fraction of tissue that was examined in this case, that many of the aphelii are distended, overexpanded. And Dr. Philo testified that normal breathing will not cause the aphelii to become distended, overinflated. So there was much testimony about, okay, then what could be the cause for the over-distension, the over-inflation? And both doctors agreed, in fact, that there's really two causes, potential causes. The first, CPR, and the second, decomposition. But there is no evidence, none whatsoever, that Gale or anybody attempted to perform CPR here. There's none whatsoever. Now, hypothetically, theoretically, play that out in your mind that if somebody performs CPR on somebody, then necessarily they don't have a purpose to cause death. They're trying to save a life. So it makes no sense whatsoever for the prosecutor to argue that the distension was caused by CPR because that would be inconsistent with purpose to cause death. But more importantly, there's no evidence whatsoever that anybody was present when Gail gave birth, and no evidence that some other third party <coughs> performed CPR. <coughs> And, and the very fact that the prosecution introduces that to you is important to, number one, it, it's now really a tacit acknowledgement of reasonable doubt, because they don't know. They don't know what happened. And it's also a tacit acknowledgement that they recognize that the real reason for the distinction isn't CPR. It's decomposition. That can be the only rational conclusion here. It's the only evidence, let's put it that way. It's a theory that they would propound to you. Well, what if somebody else was present? And what if the other person that was present performed CPR. Wouldn't that explain the distension? Well, I, I, maybe, I guess, sure. But we don't operate in theories here in a court of law. We operate on evidence and proof, and proof sufficient to meet their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So CPR, in theory, maybe, 
but there's no evidence of that. And even if there was, what would that say about her intent to cause death? So, so really, when we're looking at this <coughs> issue of the expanded avelia and the the explanation for the distended avelii. It can't be CPR. It has to be decomposition. And, and then this is where it's really critical to understand. You'll recall that the state calls to the witness stand Dr. Philo. He testified at length on direct <coughs> examination, the prosecutor asking him questions. <coughs> then I get the opportunity to question Dr. Philo on cross-examination. And then the prosecution gets the opportunity to then re-examine, redirect examination, we call it, and question Dr. Philo. And during redirect examination, the prosecutor asked Dr. Philo about this issue of the distended abelia <coughs> and whether the decomposition could cause the distended abelia, which of course we know. That's been clearly and definitively established. But he went on to say, well, what about the expanded but not distended avelia? Would the decomposition cause the open air spaces, the, the, dis, the, the expanded but not yet distended air spaces? And he said, yes. Think about that. Let that resonate a minute. And, and, and what Dr. Phelan went on to explain, that it's not the, 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 the process of getting to the point of distension, he used the analogy, it's not an on or off switch, it's more of a dimmer switch, meaning representing the continuum, it's a process, which only makes sense, because if you have collapsed the VLAI, they have to first become expanded before they can become distended. Obviously, right? So, when Dr. Philo acknowledges on redirect examination that the decomposition would cause the air spaces to expand and some of them get to the point of distension, and, and, and in theory, had, had the body remained exposed, then even more of the expanded abelii would become distended. So that concept right there is as, as, as close as you're going to get to absolute proof that those tissue slides and this whole idea of, the ex, of, of relying on these tissue slides and the expanded of VLEI as proof beyond a reasonable doubt that it's live birth is, is in fact completely unreal because of the issue of decomposition causes the expansion and the distinction. And that's the only evidence that the state has regarding the question of live birth, stillbirth. That's all they have. So, and this was just m more of summarizing Dr. Fila's testimony on that very issue. <clears throat> that the process of decomposition causes the alveoli to become expanded on its way to becoming distended. There you go. So, it would be impossible, and you'll also recall that on cross-examination <coughs> I asked Dr. Filo on this issue, if you had Two tissue slides 
And let's assume, for the sake of discussion, that tissue slide number one evidenced expanded avelii that, that theoretically we knew were the result of breathing. And you had a second <coughs> tissue slide that also had the expanded avelii that let's just assume we knew for a fact was the result of the gases formed from decomposition. Here they are, doctor. Can you distinguish between the two? Can you look at this one and say, oh, these are expanded from breathing, and these are expanded from decomposition. Can you make that distinction, doctor? No. So when both doctors look at these three tissue slides and see the expanded avelii, there's no way to determine if that's from breathing or decomposition. And that should end the inquiry there. Game over. But then when you add the fact that they're distended, and that can't be caused by breathing, and can only be caused by either CPR, which, no, no, and we're left with decomposition, that's why I say this is so hugely important to appreciate and understand because once you understand that, it's clear as day that the state has no, as in zero, reliable evidence, underscore reliable, zero, to point to the fact that this was a live birth. Let alone sufficient evidence to get them over the threshold of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. No way. Here we are. The evidence, the greater weight of the evidence points to that it's a stillbirth. We know that the decomposition caused these expanded avelii. That's the only evidence they have and they need to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that this was a live birth, and it can't be done. So we talked a little bit about um, Dr. Filo's testimony, and specifically regarding all of these things <coughs> that center in, around the expansion of these avelii. So I want to talk a little bit about the testimony of Dr. Harshbarger. And before I get to Dr. Harshbarger's testimony, let me remind you of who Dr. Harshbarger is. He's the sitting, as in currently sitting, Montgomery County Court. It's his job to support law enforcement. He works every day with prosecuting attorneys, not just in Montgomery County, because they're a regional center, I think he described it as. He serves more than 30 counties in the state of Ohio. We have 88 counties in Ohio. One out of three of our 88 counties in Ohio are served by Dr. Harshbar. And Let's talk about what he said. Look at that. We have known examples. So he, you'll recall that Mr. Marine asked him some questions. Dr. Harshbarger, before you came in to testify here, did you do any medical research regarding the issues that you're going to testify here? Recall Dr. Harshbarger said, well, as a matter of fact, I did. <coughs> 
Mark asks, well, could you explain some of the research? Yes, I read these articles that cite to these publications. And these articles demonstrate that there are known stillbirths that have expanded the And he went on to say that there's known examples of live births that have the collapse of the other. And that's why, he goes on to say, another publication that I read states that the histologic appearance, namely the appearance that's the microscopic examination, the histologic appearance should only be used as a sign of lung maturity, how far along a baby's development, as opposed to being a reliable basis for the determination of a live birth versus a stillbirth. And the reason why these, this literature emphasizes that is because of that. Because we know that there's known stillbirths that have expanded abelii, so how could that serve as a reliable basis to determine by birth? And the answer is it can't, and thus histologic appearance perfectly fine to consider as evidence regarding the question of how mature is, how, how, how developed is a baby's lung, but cannot, should not be used as a basis to determine live birth. And then ultimately you'll recall Mr. Marine asking questions of Dr. Harsbarger regarding his, what information he reviewed in this case. And he reviewed the autopsy report, the report protocol, the autopsy photos, the scene photos. He reviewed the same three tissue slides that Dr. Filo looked at. He looked at all of the available information and Dr. Harshbarger, City Montgomery County Corner, <coughs> offers his opinion that there's no way to determine to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, and that's the standard, whether this was a live birth or a stillbirth, based on the limited information available in this case. <laughs> and all of that information from Dr. Harshbarger, again, we bear no burden here, but that is certainly important information for you to consider when determining has the state met its burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt that this was a lie. So, <coughs> one of the big questions, right, is that, that you're probably sick of hearing by now already, is, is about all these alveoli and the expansion and the distension. And as I said moments ago, there's no rational dispute that decomposition caused the distended avelia. So, so the question of was there uh, decomposition 
that resulted in gases that expanded portions of the aveli. There is just no dispute. Because it's proof in and of itself. Both doctors looked at them and both doctors agree there's a certain percentage of them that are distended. So that is proof, all the proof you need that there was decomposition and thus rendering the tissue slides unreliable. That's why I was saying earlier, once you work through that, game over. But, in fact, we know that there's a mountain of evidence in addition to, but wait, there's more, regarding whether there was decomposition present that causes the gases that expand the alveoli and render those tissue slides unreliable. And there it is, right? It, it, it's it's uh, not in dispute that the uh, body was mutilated by, by animals. Th there's ample evidence of that in the photographs and the autopsy report acknowledged by both doctors and not, not, not disputed. And the significance of that for purposes of this question of decomposition, is the, uh, the, the, the bacteria in the animal's saliva. That's introduced into the body, plus all of these other factors causing and resulting in decomposition. And we also know that the body was exposed in the elements for a long period of time. Time. And, and we can uh, debate about the temperatures, and you'll have that as an exhibit, the, the climatological records that show the, the highs and low temperatures for the entire time that body was exposed to the elements. And, and certainly, like any typical Geauga, February and March, you know, it's this. But there's plenty of <coughs> days where the temperatures are in the low to mid 40s, out there for over a month. Animal bacteria. Of course, there's the composition. What if we're, we're debating that? The autopsy photographs themselves show that. In multiple locations, you see that there's you know, dark brownish colorizations on various parts of the body that both doctors pointed out when they were looking at the autopsy photographs as evidence of decomposition. And the, the, the brain tissue had essentially become liquefied. That is just piling on the evidence that the body was exposed for a long period of time and was going through decomposition changes. Of course it was. And then ultimately, the descended alveoli are are the gold standard of proof of decomposition. And, and this is important. This was Dr. Thilo's testimony. You'll recall that we were asking him, I was asking him questions about this whole notion that, well, the the body was going through decomposition. Can that cause the gases? Yes. But the, the three slides we looked at don't show the decomposition. So 
From that, are we going to conclude there was no decomposition here? <coughs> right. Of course there was, for all the reasons right there. Of course there's decomposition. And the fact that they're not present in these three slides means nothing as to the question of whether there's decomposition. It, because you'll recall Dr. Philo's testimony that bacteria know no boundaries. So once it's introduced into the body, it ravages the body. And all of the air spaces, naturally, right? Both lungs are connected, and then all those bronchial tubes are all, all flow back to that one tube right down our middle of our body. <coughs> They're all interconnected. And once you get decomposition in any area of the body, and then ultimately into the lung, it just runs rampant. <coughs> And, and, and that's just another reason why, even though the, they're not seeing it in these three slides, from that it, it would be wrong to conclude there was no decomposition here. And that's, was that all part of that questioning of Dr. Philo that pathological processes don't occur or appear uniformly? And that had you looked at other tissue slides, assuming they would be available from other, other portions of the lung. Could you, would you see evidence of bacteria? Yeah, that's the pathological processes that don't occur uniformly in the body. So we know that there was decomposition. And then we know it as well because uh, while it is correct, that Ingale's interview with law enforcement. She, she doesn't know the exact day that she gave birth. But it's pretty easily deduced. Because, uh, let's start with, she gave birth in the Cantor's residence. She worked Monday through Friday. So, we, we know that it was a weekday. And she then is questioned, well, uh, how long did the body remain in the trunk of your car before you disposed of the bag and the body on, well, in Geauga County? And she isn't clear other than to say, days, could be a week. <coughs> and then she goes on to say that, you know, me as in Gail, I drove these three or four young ladies uh, that were part of my church youth group out to the church retreat at Camp Koinonia. And then from there, I I found a reason to leave the camp <coughs> briefly, and I drove a few miles away to some area I'm not familiar with, and disposed of the bag. So you have in evidence the the literature from camp the the church retreat at Camp Koinonia in 1993, and it demonstrates 26, 27th, and, or, excuse me, 26th, 27th, and 28th were the dates of the retreat. So it only stands to reason that the birth would have taken place on one of these two days, 22nd or the 23rd, the body remained in the trunk of the car for several days, less than a week as it turns out. Drove to Camp Koinonia, 
disposed of the body, where it remained in the woods <coughs> for the 27th, the 28th, one, two, uh, until discovered on the 25th of March. So, and for whatever it's worth, you'll recall the detective's testimony that he was in fact able to confirm with the three young ladies that were high schoolers at the time, now 29 years ago, that, yep, Gail drove us out to the church retreat that was held. <clears throat> well, they didn't say this, but we know the literature demonstrates this. They said it was in the spring of 93. Okay. And the literature clearly demonstrates 26, 27, and 28. So, it's, again, easily deduced that, that that body was either 31 or 32 days, depending on whether the birth was on the 22nd of February versus the 23rd of February, 31 or 32 days, exposed in the elements, mutilated by animals, run over by a And as you would expect, was in the process of decomposition, de decomposing. Here is some of that literature that, again, you have in evidence that clearly shows the dates of the Camp Koinonia church retreat. So, again, as to that question of was there decomposition here, I mean, it, it, it just can't be rationally disputed. And we know the significance of the decomposition renders those tissue <coughs> slides unreliable. And that's why I said earlier at the very beginning of my closing remarks here that the greater weight of the evidence would point that this was a stillbirth and we listed some of that. And, and there is no reliable evidence that it was a live birth and for all these reasons. And so here, we were talking <coughs> also at the beginning of my remarks about this notion of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, proof of such character that an ordinary person would be willing to rely and act upon it in the most important of your own affairs. I ask you to reflect individually on what that would mean to each one of you most important of your own affairs. And the type and quality of information and evidence that you would want in making such a critical decision that would impact the most important of your own affairs. And and then and then as you're thinking about that, apply that to to whatever what information and evidence you're being asked to rely upon in making that critical determination. And through through no no fault of the prosecutor's office or Detective Seaman or Chief Neas, what what we're left with is a body that has been decomposing out in the elements, mutilated by animals, run over by a vehicle. And, and from
from that, tissue samples, a very small, limited portion of tissue samples, are necessarily degraded, compromised, and we know that from the decomposition. And that's the sort of information that you're forced to rely upon. And that is not the quality or type or amount of information that you, in your everyday lives, would rely upon in making a decision that affected the most important of your own affairs. We also know that Dr. Philo acknowledged that the autopsy report, he didn't prepare the autopsy report. He did not, he had secondhand information all the way around here because obviously this occurred almost 30 years ago. Now, Dr. Challoner is the one who prepared the report and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Philo can just review that report. And in his review of the report, you'll recall he acknowledged that the report itself is vague and incomplete. And specifically, it's vague and incomplete in a few key areas, obviously regarding the, the lung tissue, because that's the only thing that the state offers as evidence of a live birth. And, and, and there's nothing in the report that even talks about the, the, the lung tissues that, that were sampled. <clears throat> For example, we don't know where the lung tissue samples were taken from. And that's particularly important because, number one, you know, one lung's gone, so 50% of the tissue is not even available for examination. We know that these pathological processes don't occur uniformly, and thus, it's so important to take as many samples as possible from different locations. And in fact, if Dr. Philo was originally presented this case, he, he talked about how he would take and examine the entirety of the remaining lung. But that didn't happen here. And so uh, now we're, we're left to wonder and guess, speculate, you know, where, where were these tissue samples taken from within the lung? And, and this is a big one that both doctors, right here, that both doctors talked about as being important and, and talking about the texture of the lung. So the doctors performing the autopsy, one of the things, and, and they're in, in a case like this, where they're trying to make that important determination as to whether it's a live birth, one of the things that they would want to do is feel it, feel the texture. Is it spongy and inflated, or whatever the exact words were, or more dense, etc. And and that's an important uh, piece of information that both doctors acknowledged would be important regarding this issue. And none of that's included in the report. And so, and the tissue is no longer available. So. We don't know. And that's part of why Dr. Philo acknowledged that the autopsy report is vague and incomplete. And again, just more, or the lack of information available for the doctors and ultimately for you. And here again, as to the question of can the state prove beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, uh, the baby was born alive, they point to these three T 
tissue slides as their only evidence. And you'll recall I asked uh, Dr. Philo some questions about that. And that whole notion of uh, pathological processes occur in different places, not uniformly. And, and he acknowledged that to use a small sample of lung tissue as representing what the entirety of the lung tissue would look like <coughs> would re result in a biased diagnosis. I didn't say that. Dr. Philo said that. To take a small amount of lung tissue and represent that as being representative of the entirety of the lung tissue would result in a biased diagnosis. Isn't that what we have here? Isn't that precisely why Dr. Philo said, if I were doing this, at the outset, if this was my case from the beginning, I would want all of the lung tissue, not even samples, because again, he talked about the fact that 50% of the lung tissue isn't even available. All we have in this case to try and determine live birth is the lung tissue. We don't want a biased diagnosis. We want as much information as possible. We know that you can look at a slide from one area of the lung, compare it to a slide from another area of the lung, and it can look different. So if I were doing this, I'd be Dr. Philo. I, I, I would uh, cut, cut that lung tissue up into, I think he said, 10 or 12 pieces, send each one of those off to the histology lab, they would in turn put that in the cassette, create the, 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 the wax blocks, <coughs> and then microscopically slice those blocks and examine as much tissue as possible so as to not have a biased diagnosis. That didn't happen. And again, more examples of the, the quality or lack thereof of reliable evidence and more examples of the absence of important information that you in your everyday lives making a decision of the most important of your affairs would demand, require, expect And this is certainly, certainly the most important of Gail Ritchie's affairs. She has those same expectations. Just more, more information from Dr. Harshbarger that you'll recall that um, States Exhibit 12, which is a photograph taken from the autopsy that is, um, well, it's, it's, I don't really know how to say it, it's a slab of tissue, body tissue, that includes the heart, and there's those four steps pulling the pericardial sac back so you can see the, the animal damage to the heart, the sac around the heart, and then, and then the doctor pointed to, this is the lung. And he talks about how, in, in Dr. Harshbarger, Dr. Harshbarger's assessment, the city Montgomery County coroner's assessment, was that the lung did not appear to be expanded or aerated. He's looking at that same information available to Dr. Philo, and he says, this does not appear expanded or aerated. In fact, it's 
shrunken, it has sharp margins, and you know, and, and, and you recall that's where Dr. Hirschberger used the analogy of um, drywall, and and how the drywall you know edge is sharp in the corners, and then you can ultimately use some tool to round that off and, and analogize that. That's akin to an, a fully aerated lung would would not have those sharp margins. It would have that rounded look to it. And that wasn't present here. And, and he said that just, just looking at States Exhibit 12, this does not appear to be an aerated lung, and that that would be less consistent with this issue of live birth. We could have, in fact, put this slide earlier into our presentation when we were talking about the greater weight of the evidence <coughs> points to the fact that this was a still birth. And that would be Dr. Harshbarger's testimony regarding his opinions from looking at State's Exhibit 4. So, clearly, th this is a, a tragic situation, all the way around. And uh, the manner in which this baby's body was disposed of. to that, of course it's <coughs> terrible. And it's difficult to look at some of those images. It can't help but evoke <laughs> emotion. We wouldn't be human if we didn't have an emotional response to those images. <coughs> but we're not here to decide this case on emotion. And we're in a court of law. And you took an oath to well and truly try the case that is State of Ohio versus Gail Ritchie. You took an oath to follow the instructions of law that Judge Andre will read to you at the conclusion of our arguments here. You have a duty a responsibility to consider the facts and the evidence here. You have to follow the burden of proof rests entirely with the state of Ohio. This is not a question of more likely than not. That is not enough. This is not a situation where theories are enough. There could have been somebody else present. What? Somebody else could have performed CPR. There's no evidence of that. That's a theory. That's not 
Enough! Proof beyond a reasonable doubt to each and every element. That means, let's be, let me be clear and explicit, that means as to the question of whether this was a live birth, because if we do not have a live birth, th there cannot be a crime. And again, the greater weight of the evidence points to a stillbirth, but if you, mm, you for whatever reason, don't buy that or accept that, or you doubt that or question that, you're not sure if that's a true, right? if you agree with that, okay, <clears throat> then your verdict must be not guilty in that scenario. You, you must be firmly convinced beyond a reasonable doubt <coughs> that this was in fact a live birth. So that burden rests entirely with the state and it is a high and heavy burden. And even that's not enough because you must also determine by proof, by evidence, sufficient to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that Gail Ritchie acted with criminal intent, that it was her intent to kill this baby, that she knew it was alive, <coughs> knew and understood and appreciated that this is a live baby and that I intend to kill this baby. And there's no evidence of that. There's, there's no evidence, no reliable evidence, that this was a live birth. So while this is a tragic situation <clears throat> that evokes all sorts of emotions when we look at those images, Here we are, at the conclusion of this case, you have a duty to follow the law. You have a responsibility, you took an oath to decide this case based on the facts and the evidence presented in this courtroom only. And all of that facts and all of those that evidence clearly demonstrates that the state does not know what happened here and cannot prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Gail Ritchie committed either the crimes of aggravated murder or murder. And for all of the reasons that I've talked with you for the last hour or whatever it is, You can only return verdicts of not guilty to both counts of this indictment, and that is exactly what we're asking you to do in this case. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Burling, will there be any further? Okay. Why don't, before we begin, just everybody gets a chance to stretch one more time, and then... <coughs> It's going to be a re uh, rebuttal argument. Okay, please proceed. beyond a reasonable doubt, what it means, and what it doesn't mean.
could be pretty uh, cloudy. But also, the world could end today. Anything beyond all doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. A doubt based on reason. And keyword, common sense. Because we want you to come in here with your previous life experiences. My mom says to my youngest brother that he doesn't have a lot of common sense. And we hope that all of you have that common sense and decide that case with common sense and reason. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof of such a character that you would rely upon it in the most important of your own affairs buying a house, having surgery, choosing to get married, choosing whether to start a family. Those are all the most important of your affairs. And you're looking to evidence similar weight to that. There's been a lot of talk about live birth versus stillbirth. You have the autopsy report from Dr. Challender, you have the testimony, Dr. Philo, you have Dr. Philo's report, you heard from Dr. Harshberger, you have Dr. Harshberger's report. No one has said this is a stillbirth. No one. Dr. Philo, Dr. Harshberger, they looked at the same information, with one exception. Dr. Harshberger also listened to the defendant's interview. The fact that he couldn't even remember to put in his expert report. And Dr. Harshberger doesn't disagree with Dr. Philo about a lot of things. He looked at those three slides. He doesn't disagree that that 5% not expanded, 40% distended, 55 to 60% open airspace. He doesn't disagree that that's wrong. He doesn't disagree with Dr. Philo. Dr. Philo, Dr. Harshberger, they both told you in those three slides, they didn't see any decomposition in those lungs. They agree about the coloring of the lungs. That salmon-y pink color that, you're, that you see in those autopsy pictures of the lung, that's consistent with lungs that have been aerated. They've been expanded. They breathed. They agree that that salmon-y pink color is consistent with breathing. But, despite all that, and I, I know that Mr. Bradley focused a lot of his closing on the live birth versus stillbirth. Testimony Dr. Philo, versus the testimony of Dr. Harshberger. You're not deciding that this case in a vacuum. Those are not the only two witnesses that you heard from. You are to consider all of the evidence, all of the witnesses, in deciding this case. It's not Dr. Philo versus Dr. Harshberger. It's all of the evidence. The judge is going to instruct you on direct evidence versus circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence, that is the testimony that you heard in this courtroom, the stipulations that were read to you, and the evidence that you'll see. And then there's circumstantial evidence. And that's the example of Johnny ate a cherry pie. You can watch Johnny eat the cherry pie, and that's direct evidence. Or you can leave the room, you can come back, there's a slice taken out of that pie, Johnny's got some whipped cream, maybe some cherry on his mouth. Circumstantial evidence that Johnny ate the cherry pie. This case has circumstantial evidence all over the place. And when you look at the circumstantial evidence, I'm talking about the defendant never telling a single person never telling a single person that she was pregnant, and then never telling a single person for 26 years about what happened. 
She didn't tell her friends. She didn't tell her family. Not her husband. Not her minister. Not even her doctor. And you heard Detective Seaman ask her about that. Ask her if she told her doctor. Well, when, when you had other kids, didn't you tell your doctor about this one? No. Don't you think that would have been important for the doctor to know? If this was a stillbirth, wouldn't the doctor want to know that information? Well, she admitted that even if the doctor had asked, she would have lied about it. She never told a single person. The garbage bag. Putting the baby in a garbage bag. And then putting that garbage bag in your trunk, driving it, put, placing that garbage bag in the woods. That's circumstantial evidence that the baby was born alive. That's consciousness of guilt. <coughs> Trying to get that baby as far away as possible so that no one can link it back to you. and intent. And they mean the same thing. Now, the judge is going to tell you that you can decide someone's purpose, someone's intent, based on the facts and circumstances. Because you cannot look into the mind of another. And you're deciding this case not based on the intent that the defendant tells you in the interview 26 years later but you're looking for the intent that she had back in 1993. Now when a couple or, or a woman gets pregnant, there are a lot of things that happen between finding out she's pregnant and then delivering. And some of you mentioned that in voir dire. Telling people, t telling loved ones that you're pregnant. Figuring out how to afford the baby. Maybe you're going to make certain, um, not going to go out to dinner, not going to eat, eat, get your coffee. Figuring out how to afford that child. Attending a baby shower. <coughs> registering for gifts. Going to the doctor. Nowadays people have gender reveal parties. Thinking of baby names coming up with a birth plan, where to give birth, what doctor, are you going to have an epidural, are you going to give birth at home, with a doula. But the defendant didn't have any of those birth plans. She didn't do anything to get ready. Because her one birth plan was to get rid of the baby, no matter what. And she did. And based on facts and the circumstances that you've heard. You can infer her intent based on what she did. She put it in a bag and she got rid of it. And I say it because those are her words. That's what she calls her baby 26 years later. She has no emotional attachment to the baby. She doesn't cry. Is that reasonable? Does that make sense? If this is the baby that she lost? Or does that make more sense when it's a baby she killed? She says in the interview she doesn't remember a sound. She doesn't remember if it moved. Is that reasonable? Does it make sense? Or would a mother remember that? And remember for 26 years that that baby didn't make a sound and how emotional it was for her. And that baby didn't move and how upset it made her. Wouldn't she think about that for 26 years? 
by the time Detective Seaman gets to her, she's been thinking about it for two weeks. She says she hasn't thought about this, shot, thought about it in 26 years. She has absolutely no emotion. When Detective Seaman approaches her in the driveway or in that interview room, the only emotion she has is when Detective Seaman leaves and she cries for her husband. That's it. No emotion for this baby. Now, it is the state's burden to prove all the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. And the state has done that. And for those reasons, we ask that you find the defendant guilty of both aggravated murder and murder for what she did back in 1993. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a recess now. And uh, uh, I, the attorneys and I have some issues we're going to have to resolve. So this is probably going to be a 20 minute. So you got plenty of time to use the restroom or get coffee or whatever uh, it is. And then we will call you back for me to give you instructions. We're adjourned. Thank you. Yeah,